Hi, uh, this is Janet Fitch, and it is noon on Wednesday, so it is Writing Wednesday, uh, where I answer your writing questions, um, craft questions, moral questions, uh, existential questions. Uh, it all goes into the mix. It's all part of the writer's life. And um, I have... Uh, several questions uh, that came in to me from the interwebs and I've also um, got some ideas or questions uh, that I would like to address today but if you have questions as we go along feel free to put them in the comments um, and uh, I'll be happy to answer them and if you ever want me to design a writing Wednesday around your uh, your questions um, you can send them to me in on my website, JanetFitchWrites.com. So it is uh, the end of June right now. Um, uh, many people are hitting the road. Um, I'm getting ready to teach uh, at the Community of Writers um, uh, in a couple of weeks, which is the first time they've been in, in real reality um, for quite some time. So I'm very excited. I'm very, um, I'm a big proponent of real reality, as you know. I, I do a lot of teaching online. I love that. But um, I am going to be, I'm a huge advocate of uh, interacting with physical reality. Um, I um, think that we are all starving for that, um, uh, for that connection with the world. And as writers, our biggest challenge is to how to um, engage with the physical world, how to describe the physical world. When I taught um, at USC in, the, in a graduate program, Masters of Professional Writing, um, students were able to do so much. They were able to, um, uh, they understood, they came to understand writing in scenes, they understood the dramatics, they um, uh, became very flexible, good and flexible with um, language, write, you know, writing the sentence and stuff, but I was very surprised how difficult just engaging with the physical world was. Um, we get so insular, we sit in front of our, and now more than ever, we're in front of our screens, we're in front of more screens, we're looking at this screen while we're, you know, working on our phones and, uh, you know, we have three things going and uh, emails and social media and all blah, 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 that we forget to check in with physical reality, which is um, all real things happen in the body. We live in the body. We need to respect that. We need to pick up um, the sense data from the physical body and find language to describe what we are experiencing so that the books that we are writing do not seem theoretical, they are not sketchy, they are not, uh, uh, it's not a screenplay. Uh, the richness of the novel is the richness of the world and the richness of this sense organism, sensing organism that is the human being, the human body, is what your reader will identify with when they read your stuff. Now most ordinary people, civilians, your, your readers, um, they do not have time to explore the physical world the way you do. You've decided that this is what you want to do, you want to write. Um, the real work, the real muscle building that uh, I have seen working with generations of writers uh, is the, training the ability to engage the physical world and find language to represent what you are experiencing. And they go hand in hand. It's like uh, if you don't have the language, you don't, if you don't have the words, you don't even see the world. Um, 
it's like a you know i i an example is is there's a one of the tribes in the amazon their language does not distinguish between pink and white it's they use one word for the two and literally you show something pink and something white and they just say it's the same color um our language blue uh we have one word for blue and if you show somebody a light blue and a dark blue you know are these the same color yeah they are you know because we don't have a separate word for those two colors um so a lot of this is is finding language so that we see more clearly isn't that funny it works both ways um everybody many people are on vacation uh school is finally letting out uh people are traveling people are um have a little more time to um work on their writing and when we're working on writing we're not necessarily writing our this particular story i i think that's what sometimes writers um get caught in their development at, you know as literary artists it, they working so hard and making uh the people move around in their novel and events happening in the novel that they um don't take the time to work their craft and develop their strength as writers so it's like uh going in where we've scheduled boxing matches back to back to back to back but we never train we just go in there and mostly get slaughtered um you have to develop the muscle to get into the ring and do something when you're there i mean that's a that is a way good way of thinking about it so I think that the thing that writers need to train and not just train once like years ago when you were younger um but train and keep training just like a concert pianist still does scales because they don't want to lose what they have um what they have built you know their level of training uh, has to be worked on at all times and our ability to describe the physical world um is um it's a practice it's not just you learn to do it and then you can always do it uh it'll fade after a while so for instance like what am i talking about i'm talking about sketching this is the topic for today is sketching um artists sketch they take a sketchbook with them and they sit there and they draw and they draw all the time you know it's part of the practice it's part of the building and keeping the muscle of observation and interpretation onto the page writers sketch as well you know i tell you I always tell you to carry a notebook with you when you see some when you see some um notable phenomenon to take a moment stop and describe what you are uh describe what you are seeing um the um you know take that extra moment you know you see some sort of a lighting effect you see a plant you know a tree doing something in the wind don't just notice it it's important to notice it but then sit there and see if you can describe it take that extra moment take that extra 5 minutes and see if you can find language to describe what you're seeing um and you'll find your you will see more as you attempt to describe it uh so it's this active give and take with obs between language and observation back and forth the more you try to describe it the more you see um and i urge you to even even if it means going to the backyard and picking a plant say i'm going to pick a plant to describe uh how do you describe a plant how do you describe anything you can describe things directly you can describe things in terms of um think of the five senses you know what do we have sight smell sound 
texture and light, right? Is that it? Taste. So light is vision. Vision is light. Light is vision. Um, then you, uh, um, so Hannah asks, is keeping a journal a useful way of sketching or is that too internal to be useful? I use a journal very differently. My journal is all about keeping my sanity, but it's also like a travel journal will we'll have all of this because it's what I carry around when I'm traveling. Uh, it will have these kind of sketches. Generally, what I do is I call these, this is the writer's notebook, which is different than a personal journal. Um, the writer's notebook, I will usually sketch it down in any kind of a, whatever I carry around with me, say a notebook like this, uh, maybe even smaller, because uh, it's kind of heavy. Um, I will sit there. The importance is the activity of engaging, like I'm going to sit here for 10 minutes, but I'll try to describe this plant. Um, I'll put it in a little journal, and then I will work at it, and then I will transfer it into, um, I have my notebook mostly, firstly, on my computer. So I'll go to notebooks in my computer. I'll go to plants and landscape or whatever category I call it. Um, and then I will type it in there. And then when I have a full page, I will print it out three hole punch and put it in a notebook on my shelf. So it's usable. You know, if I want my character in somebody's backyard, um, trying to not fight with their cousin or something, um, maybe they look at a plant and I can have these plants that I've already thought a great deal about and use one of them. So they are useful in the notebooks, uh, but it won't be in a journal because I the journals, generally I don't go through them. I don't go back through them. I don't categorize out of them. It's just my impressions. So a travel journal I will, and then I will come home eventually and download that stuff into my files on my computer and then print them out and put them in the writer's notebooks. Okay, so how do you deal with with um, this plant that you've decided to write about? I'm going to describe this plant. Um, you can describe, you're always looking for verbs. So verbs are really interesting when you're talking about a stationary object. Um, you can talk about light falling on the object. You can talk about um, the closer you look, you'll see maybe a jade plant has those. Um, you might recognize a jade plant. It has, it's a succulent. And it has um, a very fleshy kind of texture to it. Glossy, fleshy. But if you look close, you might see a red line a red border around the outside of the leaf. Uh, squeeze, it, squeeze it. What's the texture? Does it have a smell? Does it, um, what does it remind you of? What are associations with jade plant? Uh, so look at it. And I, I recently am taking cuttings uh, because many of our plants are, uh, uh, the best plants are the ones that will uh, you can break a piece and reroot, and I love that. So I found a um, a geranium, and I took a piece of it. Uh, thanks, neighbors. <laughs> and um, it's like, how would I describe that geranium? Um, you look at the leaf. You describe the shape of the leaf, but avoid technical jargon because your reader doesn't necessarily know what a pinnate leaf looks like it doesn't evoke anything so the the uh, that's why i say av avoid jargon of all kinds avoid any kind of jargon you actually have to find language real language 
rather than this sort of, you know, passcode that if you're in the know, then you'll know what pin eight is or whatever. But um, you're writing for regular people. And those words, scientific words, where they're extremely exact, are not evocative. They are not uh, something that communicates. You need to develop your own language. You know, a, uh, a, um, I, this is a, this geranium actually isn't real geranium. There, you know, technically it's a pelag pelargonium. But if I say the pelagonium, nobody's going to know what I'm talking about. And the communication is more important than the exactitude, you know. So I will call it a geranium. If I say an ivy-leafed geranium, then people can picture the leaf. It's an ivy leaf. It is a bit succulent. It gives the points are little, little pricks, little, you know, have a, the texture of of holding them, there's a prick in your skin as you touch the points of it. The flower, how many leaves in the flower? Where are the little, there's little almost stains of color along inside the throat. And I'm sure that throat has a technical name for it um, in, you know, uh, bot in botany. But that doesn't give your reader anything when you call it the Coriol, you know, the reader is just going to say, oh, they're showing off. Um, whereas if you say the throat of the flower, then people, I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, I can picture the throat of the flower. Uh, real words, not jargon, not technical terms will be very, very helpful. Um, uh, you know, what is the quality of the leaf? What is, how big is it? How big is it? You know, to, you don't necessarily want inches. Like, try to think of things that are the same size. You know, the jade plant, the size of a laundry basket, the size of a desk waste basket, the size of a shopping cart. Uh, the more your metaphor, and then you can use your metaphors all day long. So what size is it? What color is it? Is there a certain fragrance? Is there something, you know, you observe about that geranium? You know, it rain, raining red petals. I use that in, uh, in uh, uh, the revolution of Marina M that it was during the Russian civil, the, during the Russian revolution, my character gets married, no spoilers. She gets married in the local Soviet and her friend brings a clutch of flowers, which are really hard to come by in a revolution. Uh, and they're geraniums, and she they're like windowsill you know, geraniums. So she has actually sacrificed her her house plant uh, to bring flowers to this girl's wedding, and it's dripping these red petals and sort of like tears. It's uh, uh, the only color in the in the scene. So um, it's always helpful to know your, to have taken the time to observe how many leaves, where is the color really coming from? Is there a differentiation of color? Is the petal transparent, translucent? Does it change color from, from inner to outer? Does it change color as the, lead, as the, uh, the um, flowers uh, mature? Um, is uh, the little piece of geranium that I took from this <laughs> this garden. Um, it had a, a cluster of full uh, of fully blown um, blooms, and it had a cluster of uh, unformed buds, unopened buds, and this. To, so you want to get verbs. So the 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 cluster sagged, um, like being a little bit shy, you know, a little reluctant. It's like I don't, a little timid. Whereas the big flower, the form flowers, were very confident by comparison. And uh, 
Uh, the more time you spend with an object like that, you're developing your muscle uh, as a writer. And when you have a little time in the summer vacation, especially to, it's the most wonderful thing. Take a big hat so you don't burn and, um, and pick something and just sit there and describe it until you get some interesting things. You know, there's bamboo outside my window. I could sit here and talk about the shape of the bamboo, the slight curl of the leaf because uh, it's hot weather, uh, they'll open when it's moist. You know, they curl somewhat, uh, curl like cigarette paper. Um, they curl in the heat. Um, the pattern uh, that they make, uh, shadow and light, um, that makes them, what makes them beautiful, what makes them graceful. You know, they're just, it's a stick, but there's always a curve in the stick. So to really take your time and sketch, just think of it as sketching. If I was, if I was an artist, I would sketch X, but I'm not an artist. I am a literary artist. So instead of sketching that palm tree in the wind, um, the way the wind rakes through the fans and shreds them and uh, um, the kind of tremulous motion of the ends of the fans, but there's also a circular motion of the, the cluster of fans. Um, sit there and look at them and then you can see what they look like to you. Like uh, I have a, there's a row of cypresses, and they, in the wind, they come apart and they come together. And I know that Van Gogh uh, painted cypresses in his, you know, even Starry Night, very famous cypresses. They're very flame looking in his paintings. But they say that he used them to symbolize the human being that is not in the picture, that they have a very very human presence in his paintings. I have, so I have this row of cypresses out the window um, and when they come together and come apart in the wind, I could sit there and watch them do this all day. Um, it's like a group of, of women talking, you know, gossiping and their heads coming together and apart as they're discussing, you know, the, the situation of the world or the neighborhood or whatever. And I can even trip out on what they're, what they're talking about. Um, so take the time, use, you know, if you want to insert your imagination, you know, you're a writer, why wouldn't you? What is that tree dreaming? Why not? But take the time to describe the texture of the bark of that big pine. I'm going to call it a ponderosa. Uh, it's big, um, and I don't, it, it doesn't, shouldn't hinder you. It's good to find out what it is, but um, of all the birds that uh, Dylan Thomas put in his poetry, he really could only recognize like a pigeon and a seagull. <laughs> he liked the words, you know, the heron. Well, he, I'm sure he could tell a heron from a hand basket. Um, what is a heron from handsaw? Uh, but he uses words like curlew, and he wouldn't know a curlew if it hit him in the face. Um, but so feel free to use whatever language you want to use. Um, but it should be something evocative uh, if you're going to make it, you know, make it up a whole cloth. Um, <laughs> uh, you can describe the season, impact of the season on the natural object, Zunaid said. Uh, he, she, he was, she was, he was thinking about um, uh, white oleander shriveling the last of the spring grass into whiskers of pale straw. Yeah, you'll end up using it in any number of ways in your work. Um, uh, and to, uh, Hannah says, tangential, can you allow characters to speak in jargon to convey their expertise, social milieu, disinterest in being understood by the common man? Sure, you know, and you can also have a character react internally and go, God, you know, 
Joey's such a bore. Yeah, <laughs> when's lunch? <laughs> um, let's see. So I have a bunch of questions, but if you have more questions about sketching, just sketch things and really take a moment to describe watch where the light is coming from if you were a painter where would the highlights be and where would the shadows be like really look at what you're seeing touch it if it's a tree experience that bark what does it feel like you know how would it feel like to be you know jammed up against it or a character can run their fingers down it you need to be able to describe the bark of the sycamore the bark of the um, you know, Chinese elm, the bark of a pine tree, a big pine tree, a little pine tree, um, textures of, of foliage, just as if you were painting it. You know, how would you describe that tree to a Martian? Um, because we are all becoming Martians and we're desperate to come back to earth, even if it's in, in the imagination. So give that to people. Give them the physical world. Now, how much of the physical world? We talked about this last week. You know, I mean, you can't do pages and pages and pages of it. But when you're working on the musculature of, you know, of your own descriptive power, you know, go ahead and do a page. Do two pages. Put it in your notebook, in your writer's notebook, um, in the binder. Um, you'll have done, you'll have done that work. And then when you want to use it in a um, scene, it will depend on the scene, how much of that kind of language you can use. But just the process of trying to describe getting words, you might need your thesaurus. You might only have three words for that bark. But when you start thinking about it, how do I describe that sort of puzzle aspect of a Chinese elm tree's bark. And you keep looking at it and where the color is and where if you peel the gray part, it's sort of reddish underneath. And um, it, it looks like camouflage, uh, the way the puzzle pieces fit together. And you could certainly use that as a springboard for a character who has a puzzle that they're working out to sit there and pick the bark off a monkey puzzle, what we used to call a monkey puzzle tree in Chinese elm. Um, let's see. Well, I've got a few more questions and please I'll keep watching the, I'll keep watching the comments. Um, is there such a thing as over-researching your fiction novel? Well, first, I, I beg you to stop using the term fiction novel. A novel is, in fact, a work of fiction. You can just say novel. Every novelist in the world cringes when they hear fiction novel, all right? Um, it can be a work of fiction or it can be a novel. Uh, uh, is there such a thing as over-researching is the question. I'm just being picky. Um, yeah, well, over-researching is... It means researching instead of writing. You know, it's having enough to start work, but thinking you need to know more. The thing about historical is that there is no end to what you can find out about something. So always think, do I have enough to get started and figure that do your research while you're writing. So you're only needing to research what you need for this chapter, assuming you've already done kind of your basic research. Say you're writing, uh, you're writing uh, about Santa Monica in the 70s. And if you have kind of a vague idea of Santa Monica in the 70s, you start working and you research while you are writing. And you might find out, oh, they might have gone to this concert or there was this local 
scuffle that everybody was talking about, or there was red tide, or there was uh, the pier fell down, or you'll start picking up things. But generally, over-researching, you're not writing history, you're writing fiction. So, you know, um, if you are researching instead of writing, that's not a good thing. Okay, here's another one. How does one write fiction with more depth? That's a really good question. I am, you ha start thinking about bigger issues. Look for the bigger issues. Um, as your characters are going through the drive through they're going to get a hamburger and then they're going to go into work where they're having a problem. And there's a little insight that a character can have as they go through the drive through They think about something that probably will relate to this job that they have a problem with. Um, maybe they see the guy sweating over the or the ladies sweating over the french fries and they think about what's about to happen to them at work and wondering if they want to change places or the oddness of human life that you end up in the great lottery and she's ended up frying you know french fries and you have ended up with your head in the noose at work uh, at some you know high pressure tech job or something and think about how you might want to think about fate. You want, might want to think about um, labor. You might want to think about uh, um, reincarnation. I mean, there, anything can be a portal to a larger thought. So th that's how you write fiction with more depth. My, my uh, um, teacher, Kate Braverman, would say uh, you move to the larger issues. You take the next step. You notice and then you think again and try to see if you can connect something to a larger picture or a bigger issue of being alive and, you know, life as a human being. Um, hi, MJ. Um, uh, she says, wisdom does not consist of making the be best choice among many, but of taking the choice that, the you know, the non-choice that you're given and not bitching too much about it. That was from, uh, from uh, yeah, through a character's thought. And that was uh, from the, from the revolution of Marina M, I believe. Um Here's another question. When is prosody in fiction too ornate? So prosody, poet, the poetics. When does it get to be too ornate? Uh, taste, you know, it's... I don't want to dismiss this question just by saying it's a matter of taste. Um, but a part of this question is it's completely... Not completely, but part of the question is a matter of taste. What is or too ornate for one reader might be heaven for another reader. So first, tell you, you know, remind yourself that not everybody likes chocolate. I happen to like a rich chocolate prose. I want poet. I want the poetics. Bring it on. Um, it's for me the cutoff is when it becomes hard to follow what's going on if there's just too much language and the person can't figure out what they're supposed to feel where the forward movement is that the writer seems to just be lost in creating all of this delicious language that's where um uh i would say uh, that you've gone a bridge too far Everybody is really different in this. Some people like just a very pared down uh, prose, which can be very beautiful and artistic as well, you know. But in, I always think in American literature, we have two strands. We have the failed journalists and the failed poets. And the failed journalists like a clean, 
clear, often clauseless, often adjectiveless um, language. So that that's kind of the Hemingway school, you know, the Hemingway, the Carver, the Didion uh, minimalists. And then we have the poets. We have Melville, we have Faulkner, we have Joyce Carol Oates, you know, we have the people who love the beautiful line and uh, you'll see dependent clauses, you will see uh, beautiful metaphors, phrases. I like beauty myself. I really like beauty. I'm not a minimalist. Um, I can appreciate a good minimalist, but it's not what I want to do. Um, so purple prose is uh, often a matter of taste. What's purple to one person will be heaven to another person. Purple, there's a kind of hyperbolic exaggeration of emotion in purple prose. You know, if something happens, and, <gasps> you know, it's, it's the best thing ever. You know, you know, people like that. It's like, whatever it is, it's the best, the most, the biggest, the most horrible, you know, very hyper dramatic. And that's for me, that's where I want to pull back. You know, the language should be beautiful, but I, the, the kind of overwroughtness of emotion is what, um, where I start feeling purple. Like when I feel like I want to get a little fan out. <laughs> and um, then there's a clotted, you know, when people just are throwing too much kindling on the fire and kind of smothering the fire. Yeah. Uh, where if there's, when people start piling on description, you know, they describe, say, that geranium. They describe it three different ways. It's like a, uh, anybody ever grew, grow roses or see anybody who grows roses for competition, like at the county fair, um, they cut the side buds so that one, they put all of their, all of their attention onto one flower rather than allowing smaller side flowers to take the energy away from that central bloom. So if you have a dis strong description of Irma's, um, you know, of Irma's disdain or her, you know, frowning self um, in your, pa in a passage, and then you try to describe that same thing in a different way as a string often, you know, it's like this, it's like this, it's like this. Pick the strongest one and cut the other two. Um, that, that'll that give you the biggest impact. Um, so, I mean, anybody who has a po has poetic language, has a sense of, of, is interested in the beauty of things. Uh, there are people who will call that, um, flowery or purple. There are people who don't like, who think they don't like metaphor. You know, often people who they see themselves as writing, say, hard-boiled fiction, you know, tough guy stuff, often um, adventure, uh, thriller. And they, they're very reluctant to use interesting language. Uh, and uh, it's it's sad because it takes away from their work. You know, some of the very best thriller and suspense writers uh, write a beautiful prose. They not necessarily lyrical. I mean, often it's like, but they can really describe stuff, and they have great metaphors. You know, if you read, you know, God, read Elroy, you talk about prosody. I mean, there is a poetic there and choice of language and but there is a f there is a force i mean it's not it's not uh merrily 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 down the stream uh it it accomplishes what he wants to accomplish and it gives you such a such a strong picture and that's what we really are always looking for strength and i like strength and beauty at the same time so that's a that's a particular balance um 
Okay, here's another one. Um, what's the difference between a mean and an evil protagonist? <clears throat> That's kind of an interesting question. Um, I Usually the mean and evil people are not your protagonists. They're often uh, the antagonist. Um, so that we like your, we want to be your protagonist, and then these are the kind of people who always bedevil us. But when there is an evil or mean protagonist, the protagonist is the person who changes. So, you know, think about that. You know, if you have a mean character who is your protagonist, you're going to see some change in them. And you don't want that to be sappy. You know, that's got to be earned. It's going to be tough if they're a mean person. You can't have them suddenly seeing the error of their ways. It has to be very gradual, very subtle, and a lot of looping back, a lot of return to type. Um, I would say the difference generally between a mean character and an evil one is the act, le level of activity. There are a lot of mean people in the world, uh, which is just... You know, can I borrow your, you know, your lawnmower? No. You know, can I, you know, would you mind watching the baby? No. Um, mean people have mean judgments, you know, when you're interior or what they say, you know. Somebody's struggling with their kid and their shopping cart and all their stuff and, and somebody looks at them and go, God, you know, can't you? I just hate sweaty women, you know. It's like, yeah, that's a mean character. Evil, though, is an activity, you know. Genuine evil is doing evil things. And it's very interesting that uh, uh, Kate Braverman had an exercise that, you know, we're always working exercises. Oh, she had a wonderful exercise to list 50 um, antisocial uh, actions. That a character could perform 50 and uh, it was really fun to do to think about 50 actions that would be antisocial and I'm not gonna try to find it on the spur of the moment because watching me fumble with my notebooks is is not a an entertaining sight <laughs> um, but I remember one was just like you know filling glassine envelopes with Drano and leaving them on street corners, uh, you know, things like that. Letting an, uh, an old person's dog out of the yard, you know. I mean, I could think of a lot of really evil things. Not that I'm evil, but I certainly can imagine antisocial activities. Um, so, yeah, the difference between mean and evil protagonists is, is one does evil. One does bad things, the other just thinks bad things or says bad things. Um, I think that's a real clear definition. And But I think that having an evil character generally, I know people have made people like that their protagonists, you know, American Psycho, um, I think Flattery O'Connor sometimes has evil. She's very interested in, she's a conservative Catholic and is very interested in morality, issues of morality. So sometimes her characters are really evil. Um, but you can decide, you know, do you want them just to be mean? And then some mean people, mean thoughts, judgmental, when they're in a situation can actually be really nice and really helpful. I know some people who are just, if you hear them talk, they're just the nastiest piece of, piece of work. But, you know, if they, if you need them, you know, they're there with the snow plow or the rifle or whatever it is that you need, you know, so people are complex, you know. Um, so there's, a, there's an answer. What else do we have? Should, how would you define an experimental fiction? Is it hard to, or book, is it hard to write one, should I try? Um, no, <laughs> not a book. If you don't even know what experimental fiction is, 
uh, definitely do not spend four, five, six years writing an experimental fiction. Write a short story in a style that you've never seen before. Make make something up. I mean, experimental fiction, a lot of it uh, are fun and it's fun and games. It's fun and games. And often it doesn't stretch out into longer fiction. It just doesn't lend itself to longer fiction uh, because there's um, whatever inspiration and uh, wild idea let's do this um, is born it it's it can be extremely hard to to continue um, so I would say start reading the journals that's usually where experimental fiction is uh, uh, is placed you'll you know and see what wild things people decide to how they structure their books it's usually uh, their fictions it's usually about um, um, form, you know, like, uh, Jennifer Egan's famous short story that was all in texts and she did it, uh, over Twitter. Um, she released it sentence by sentence. Um, books like, um, Carol Mazo's Ava, everybody knows I love that, uh, David Markson, you know, these are novels made of single lines or a couple of lines. They're, they can be hybrid works like uh, like uh, Seabald. Um, you can familiarize yourself with it, but definitely think um, of an interesting form that you've never seen. Maybe by using some non-literary but written form we see all around us like she heard doing a twitter um to do you know what's experimental it's all an experiment uh so the more imaginative you are you might want to try an experimental work um maybe you don't want to use pronouns maybe you don't want to use verbs maybe you you can eliminate some colors from the possible palette decide that you're going to uh, uh, write everything from the cat's point of view um, there's very there's a, many ways to to write experimental fiction so Hannah asks curious about more sketching type exercises well sketching is just sketching so you go out with your little notebook and you see something something catches your attention and instead of just walking on, you stop and say, okay, I'm going to put this into language and I'm going to look for a verb, at least, you know, try to work for a verb, do sounds, smells, you know, touch things, smell them, describe shape. Is it hard or soft? Is it cool or warm? Is it, uh, you know, um, you know, what detail do you notice? What is an overall form? What size is it? Um, uh, what I mean is things like the antisocial exercise, uh, other prompts. Oh, there are books full of interesting prompts. The Writer's Idea book uh, from Writer's Digest was very good. Um, and if you'll look on my, um, if you'll look on my, um, YouTube channel, Janet Fitch's Writing Wednesday, I've archived a lot of these um, talks. So you might be able to look through that and look for exercises, favorite exercises. But these are engaging with physical reality exercises that I'm really asking people to get back in touch with the senses and really pick objects or pick a scene and see if you can physically describe it. Uh, you know, I was talking last week about my daughter going hiking with a bunch of people, big backpacking trip, and going to uh, Green Mesa in Utah and making the top at sunset and seeing that broken landscape, huge red broken landscape um, uh, over the tops of the mesas and stuff and people saying there there are no words to describe this and my daughter saying oh yeah 
there are you just don't know them <laughs> it's like you can't describe a big landscape like that or a big sense phenomenon like that if you haven't been working just try to describe a hill try to describe cars parked along a hill try to describe a plant try to describe the light falling on your house at a certain hour you know try to describe the way that mockingbird sits on that wire and the way it flexes its head and tail up you know and the white patches that flash when it takes off the white patches on so, I mean really try to capture things in language it's it's the most important first step in the writer's development here's another one let's see how we're doing um, how do best-selling writers work and think do they think differently than typical writers? Okay, the bestseller. Interesting. The best-selling writer is probably harder working than you are. Than I, you know, the average best-selling writer, as opposed to somebody who got lucky and got a bestseller. Um, the writers we think of as bestsellers work hard. They work really hard. I mean, I, I remember talking to uh, Robert Cray, uh, C-R-A-I-S. He's a mystery writer. He works a six-day week. He works a full eight-hour day like he's going to the bank. He doesn't go on social media. He doesn't go to parties. He doesn't go to readings. He doesn't do anything. He just works. And he cr they have to crank out a book a year, the, the mystery writers. Uh, best-selling writers are really, really hard workers, unbelievably hard workers, and they always keep in mind their audience. And this is not necessary to be like this. I, it's just the question. They asked about what are best-seller writers like and how are they different than regular uh, writers. They work much harder, much harder much harder they're completely focused on them if they need to research something they don't think hmm, do I really need to research this or, or can I just sort of make it up they there's no question if you're the best-selling writer you're going to do the research you're going to hire somebody to do the research and tell you what you need to know um, they tend to be very uh, focused very disciplined very organized um, they don't do much besides write, and that's the thing. The other thing is they're always thinking, can people follow what I'm doing? Are, you know, I cannot lose the reader. Um, so everything is weighing how, it's weighing more, um, more constantly, uh, thinking of the reader, the reader, the reader, um, bringing them along. Uh, so they're doing everything we're doing, but they do it far more intensely. Um, and they will cut stuff that I would keep in because, say, I'm interested in taking these, taking these side trips. I'm interested in the three-dimensional characterization, extremely interested in the depth and density of what I'm doing. And I think that if I was focused on being a best-selling writer and pulling in the big bucks, um, I would be scared of putting in um, a kind of too rich a brew and taking the time to follow people uh, on a side trip. And you have writers like Dostoevsky, who was an incredibly hard worker. He always needed money. You know, the need for money is an interesting addition to the mix uh, because he always needed the money. He was a gambler. Uh, he had no private income. He needed to produce uh, to pay his debts or at least, you know, try. I mean, there are times he was so broke that he sold his clothes or he sold his wife's clothes. She couldn't leave the, couldn't leave the flat because she had no clothes because he pawned them. Um, so he was very aware of that and production, you know, whereas you had a, um, you have a writer like Tolstoy 
he needed the money too because he was really into buying land and, and horses. Um, but he was an aristocrat. I mean, he didn't work in the summertime. He didn't work at this. He didn't do this. You know, he had all kinds of other interests. Um, so I think the modern bestseller idea is probably more like a Dostoevsky than a Tolstoy. But Dostoevsky also serialized. So people now, it's like, how do you reach the most people? Finding topics that other people will be interested in rather than what you're interested in. You know, I don't think that that, that doesn't interest me, you know, as a writer. Uh, you know, I'm happy to end up on the bestseller list, uh, but I can't see crafting a book towards that end. Um, it just would interfere with what I like and or am interested in in fiction. Um, how can I explain the history of my fantasy world without narrating like a historian? That is something that every writer has to deal with. How do you get the backstory in without becoming a high school textbook? You have to only tell the reader what they need to know to understand this scene that you're writing right now. If they don't need the, the whole story of Bonaparte's invasion of Russia to understand this scene, then do not try to stick that in. Um, if you need to talk about Napoleon's, you know, conquest of Moscow, you can just do it in a couple of lines. Try not to do, give us a history lesson because nobody, nobody wants that history lesson. I can guarantee you. Work it in. If you read Freshwater Road by uh, Denise Nicholas, there's a wonderful scene in, um, in a bar in Detroit, uh, dealing with Freedom Summer as the people in the bar think about different aspects of their kids and other people's kids going down to Mississippi for Freedom Summer. Um, and there's a lot of history that emerges in that, um, in that conversation as these older people remember different, you know, they remember Emmett Till, they remember seeing that in Jet Magazine. And so you work it in rather than confront it uh, and giving us an exegesis. Nobody cares about that. And the last one is kind of an interesting question and then I'll, I'll leave. Um, I want to use a polyamorous relationship in my novel, but I'm monogamous. How should I proceed? Um, I think that we're going to get novels about polyamory and all kinds of, of, you know, all kinds of choices and ways of living that are going to be really interesting. There, I'm going to assume there's a reason why you want a polyamorous relationship and not just to be stylish, that, that there's an interest in that. There's something about that that is grabbing this person. Um, you'd want to do a bunch of research. You want to research how it works. Um, you want to read articles of people who are in polyamorous relationships. Eventually you'd want to talk to people who are in polyamorous relationships and maybe have been over time. And what are the positives? What are the negatives? Remember that people are people and even if they've made a choice to be in a polyamorous relationship, there's still going to be emotion. There's going to be envy. There's going to be jealousy. There's going to be like housework kind of, you know, I mean, regular people, everybody's got the same kind of relationship problems. The polyamory adds more complexity to that situation. And who in the polyamorous situation is going to be your protagonist? Um, you know, it's like any other complex relationship among a number of people that there are different, uh, you know, who gets the short end of the stick, you know, who kind of does decide how things are going to go, you know, the one that everybody really wants to be with. Um, <laughs> so anyway, try not to make it a, a utopia because anything involving people is not going to be utopia. I know that you want it to make it um, 
a, a successful positive experience uh, depicted, but try not to whitewash it. Um, so anyway, those are my questions uh, for today, and uh, I wish you good writing, and uh, do get out your sketchbook and start describing the world. You know, build that muscle, do some reps. Okay, talk to you next week. Bye.